How's everyone doing? Good. Rock, you doing good? Yes. Doing well? Man, let me pray for you. Father, I just thank you for the people of God. I thank you uh, just for the opportunity to stand before family. All I've ever wanted was to be one of your kids. That's it. All I've ever wanted was to dwell in your house with your family and sit at your table and eat from your hands. And here we are. So I thank you just for the opportunity as I look out and I don't see strangers, I see family members, I see uh, people who have loved me well. I see people uh, who've prayed for me, who've contended with me and for me. I see people who uh, could preach this message way better than I could. And it's not because they are great orators or, or communicators, but because they have beautiful lives. Beautiful lives worth emulating. So it's an honor. I'm humbled. I'm humbled to speak to your people. Lord, help us as we open up your word. Teach us something. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. amen. If you have your Bible, turn with me to, to Genesis 29. And just put your thumb there. We're going to get to it. But I, I want to kind of set some things up for you. Uh, when I was a kid... Um, I lived in this neighborhood that had a lot of kids that were my age. And we were new to the area. It was a di really diverse neighborhood, and we were new to the neighborhood. Ourselves. Like, we had afros, you know, it just made, like, just the most funny dynamic in, in the neighborhood. No one really, uh, you know, knew where we were from. We were from out of, out of the city, and we were, we're new. We had everything in our neighborhood, everything. Um, we had a neighbor across the street from us. You remember him? His name was Michael. Now, Michael, and I grew up with Brandon, so Brandon's going to know about this. Michael had everything. Now, he had, you know, all the accessories we needed for all the sports we played. He had the basketball court. He had the basketball. He had the football. He had the chalk that we would mark the street with for touchdowns. He had the baseball equipment, the bats, the bases. We would even use his lawn for the baseball field because it was just the best lawn to do it on. He had a mattress in his garage that his dad brought out into the garage because we all loved wrestling so much. We were really into WWF. And so his dad brought a mattress out into the garage, and we would wrestle on it every single day. He had a black box. You guys remember a black box cable? <laughs> where like you had all the, 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 the pay-per-view was just provided. We would always watch WrestleMania and Royal Rumbles with him. He had in his garage a refrigerator that was always stocked full of Capri Suns. I mean, our childhood was phenomenal. Listen, I would be outside all day. We'd spend so much time outside that I would come in at nighttime. My aunt would look at me and she would say, man, you're blacker than you were this morning because I would, I would like just be in the sun. Uh, we would be in the mid of summer and we would build these sweat tarps and we would go inside the sweat tarps and we would just sweat like crazy. And then we would send Michael into the house to ask his dad if we could swim because he had the swimming pool, too. I mean, we had everything. It felt that way. We had everything. We had all this access except. There are these two girls that lived in our block and they were relatively good looking. But, but the legend on our block was that their older brothers were in gangs. And so a ton of boys on the street, two really good looking girls on the street, but we all just knew we had this, this understanding, this handshake agreement, you know, that before you go talk to these girls, you better take a few steps back and examine yourself because you may just get into a situation you can't get out of. Or... As we said it when we were children, we would quote the great poet Ice Cube, and we would say, you better check yourself before you wreck yourself. <laughs> say that. You better check yourself before you wreck yourself. 
I just got you guys to say that. You just said that. If anyone asks you what you learned at church today, just tell them you learned some early 1990s hip-hop lyrics. Be good. Be good. Maybe they'll come next week. That'd be awesome. So we've been in a series that uh, we've been calling Reset, and the objective has been to discuss what it looks like to have peace in an age of anxiety. We've been reading uh, John Mark Homer's book, The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. That's a great title. I mean, it, it, the title of his book could be Check Yourself Before You Wreck Yourself. You know, but, you know, that's just me. But we've been using themes from his book um, as kind of a springboard in our messages the last few weeks. And the thing that I was really captured by as I read his book was uh, this uh, research that was done. He quoted uh, some research that was done by Michael Zigarelli out of Charleston Southern University School of Business. Uh, Michael Zigarelli did a five-year study on the pervasiveness of distractions among Christians. Okay? He surveyed tens of thousands of Christians, asking them a question, or actually a few questions, but one of the questions on the, the questionnaire, the survey, was the busyness of life, this actually was a statement, not a question, the busyness of life gets in the way of developing my relationship with God. And they had to respond to that question. Mr. Ridge, God bless you, brother. My high school basketball coach, man, good to see you, good to see you, good to see you. Uh, but yeah, so he did the survey, and the, the statement was, the busyness of life gets in the way of developing my relationship with God, and they had to respond to it. And six out of ten Christians said, that is often or always the case for me. Six out of ten. The busyness of life gets in the way of developing my relationship with God. And so from this survey, he then teased out uh, uh, this cycle that Christians get themselves caught in. I'm just telling you, this is challenging. This is convicting. If you're not convicted by this, God bless you. Uh, but here, listen to the cycle that Christians find themselves in, obstacles of growth. Number one, the first thing that happens to Christians is we assimilate to a culture of busyness, hurry, and overload, which leads to number two, God becoming more marginalized in Christians' lives. We, we begin to compartmentalize our relationship with God. We begin to push him out on the fringes of our lives, which leads to number three, a deteriorating relationship with God. The relationship starts to go downhill, which leads to number four, Christians becoming even more vulnerable to adopting secular assumptions about how to live, which leads to number five, more conformity to a culture of busyness, hurry, and overload. And the cycle repeats. And so the question I have for you as we get started today is, do you have an early warning system in your life that safeguards you against spiritual drifting? Do you? Do you have safeguards in your life that, that, that you have that, that help you so that if you begin to, to, to drift spiritually, you can catch yourself? Do you have the ability to check yourself before you wreck yourself? Zigarelli's cycle reminds me, it's reminiscent of a few things that we see in scripture. The first thing is, uh, or the first person is Samson in the book of Judges. Uh, Samson uh, was an Israelite warrior. He was set apart by God uh, to be a leader and judge over Israel. And Samson fell in love with a woman named Delilah. And that was on him because, you know, Delilah's name literally has the word lie in it, right? And I thought, oh, that's not funny. Okay. I won't say that second service. I won't. But he fell in love with this woman named Delilah, and it was decisions like marrying Delilah that contributed to his spiritual drift. And so Lila figured out what the key was to... Uh, his strength, and she cut his hair, and then she sold him out to the Philistines. And when they came to ambush him, I want you to see what Samson said. Samson woke himself up, and he said this. He said, I will go out as at other times and shake myself free. But listen to this. But he did not know that the Lord had departed from him. Would you know it if the Lord departed from you? Would you know it? How do you guard against spiritual drift in your life? How do you do it? 
According to Zigarelli, it's distraction, it's hurry, it's overload that contributes to a lot of our spiritual drift. Uh, Corey Ten Boom said it this way. She said, if the devil can't make you sin, he'll make you busy. See, both sin and busyness have the same effect. Uh, they will wreck your connection to God. They will wreck your connection to other people. They will wreck your connection even to your own soul. And so if we don't check ourselves, we will find ourselves, and Comer talked about this in his book, if we don't check ourselves, we will find ourselves starting businesses but wrecking marriages. Uh, we will find ourselves spending all of our time trying to, you know, make our children good students uh, and get them into these good colleges, but we'll never teach them the way of Jesus. Uh, we'll load ourselves up with all these degrees and get all these letters after our names, but we'll learn the hard way that intelligence is not the same as biblical wisdom. We'll make all this money, but we'll never grow rich in the things that really matter. And the things that really matter, ironically, are not things, right? We'll watch, we'll binge watch 14 seasons of the next latest and greatest series, whatever it is, but we'll never be people who actually learn how to love prayer. We got to check ourselves, yeah? See, with all the talk of busyness, hurry, and overload, most of it is self-inflicted. It is. It is. And so Ziggurelli's uh, cycle, it doesn't just remind me of Samson in scripture, it also reminds me of the Old Testament prophet Jeremiah. Now Jeremiah uh, is an Old Testament prophet that God sends to his people Israel. Israel in Jeremiah's time is on the brink of exile. The Babylonians are coming and God sends Jeremiah to warn them of judgment. And I just want you to hear what he says. All right, God says this through Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter two, he says, my people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water, and have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. Can I tell you something? I don't think it's busyness and hurry that's ground zero of the issue. It, it, it's, it, it's something deeper. It's, it, it's just the expression. Right? It's just the busyness and overload and hurry, just a manifestation of something deeper. The reason why we're so busy, the reason why we're always in a hurry, the reason why we operate at a frenetic pace in life, the reason why we're so overloaded is because we have a thirst problem. We have a thirst problem. Let me set this up for you guys, okay? Uh, C.S. Lewis, uh, he wrote a series of books. Uh, maybe you're familiar with it, The Chronicles of Narnia, yeah? And one of the books, the fourth book in that series, is called The Silver Chair. Now, in this book, there's a little girl named Jill. And Jill represents humanity so well because she is convinced that she just knows everything, that she's got it all figured out, and she needs no help from anyone else. You know anyone like that? Anyone? She's convinced of it. And she wants nothing to do with Aslan, the, the, the lion who represents Christ in the story, yet she is desperately searching for water. I wanna just kinda of read an exchange, and it's a little lengthy, but just stick with me, it'll preach, okay? So Jill grows unbearably thirsty. She can hear a stream somewhere in the forest. Driven by her thirst, she begins to look for this source of water. Cautiously, because she is fearful of running into the lion, she finds a stream, but she is paralyzed by what she sees there, Aslan huge and golden, still as a statue, but terribly alive, is sitting beside the water. She waits for a long time, wrestling with her thoughts and, co and hoping that he'll just go away. Then Aslan says, if you're thirsty, you may drink. Jill is startled and refuses to come closer. Are you not thirsty? Said the lion. I am dying of thirst, said Jill. Then drink, said the lion. May I? Could I? Uh, would you mind going away while I do? Said Jill. The lion answered this only by a look and a very low growl. And just as Jill gazed at its motionless hulk, she realized that she might as well have asked the whole mountain to move aside for her convenience. The delicious rippling noise of the stream was driving near frantic. Will you promise not to do anything to me if I come? I make no promise, said the lion. Jill was so thirsty now that without noticing it, she had just come a step nearer, 
do you eat girls? She said, I have swallowed up girls and boys, women and men, kings and emperors, cities and realms, said the lion. Now, I didn't say this as if it were boasting, nor if it was, as if it were sorry, nor if it was angry. It just said it. I dare not come and drink, said Jill. Then you will die of thirst, said the lion. Oh, dear, said Jill, coming another step nearer. I, I suppose I must go and look for another stream then. There is no other stream, said the lion. Every single one of us in here has what you can call a soul thirst. David said it this way in Psalm 42. He said, as a deer pants for water, so my soul thirsts. It longs after you. He also said in Psalm 107, for he has satisfied the thirsty soul and the hungry soul. He is filled with what is good. See, David understood there is no other stream. Only God can quench our thirst, yeah? But, but a relationship with God takes work. A, a relationship with God takes effort. Uh, and in the chaotic world we live in, a relationship with God takes discipline. Like, like it's easier to succumb to the temptation to forsake God and instead dig uh, crack cisterns for ourselves that don't hold water. It's easier. It really is. And so what we're going to do in the time we have left is we're going to look at two thirsty people. Two thirsty people. Interestingly enough, their stories are both based at a well. And these two are both looking for love in all the wrong places. Um, their issue may not necessarily be your issue, but their hope for true love is a proxy for the soul thirst that we all have in our lives. We need to know what, how drinking from broken cisterns works itself out in our lives. And I just figured that, you know, it's almost Valentine's Day. We're all in the mood for a love story, yeah? Yeah. And so first, we're going to look at Jacob in Genesis 29. Uh, and in, in Genesis 29, thirsty Jacob walks up to a well. And just like we see in all of the best chick flick, boy meets girl movies, right? Singing in the Rain, got Titanic, right? You got, I'm thinking of a black movie, uh, Waiting to Exhale. <laughs> <laughs> Brandon, Brandon, you got to help me. Yeah. You know. Loving basketball. Loving basketball. Thanks, Carrie. Man, you really came through. <laughs> just like we see in all the best, I'm going to just move on, all the best boy meets girl, chick flick movies, Jacob meets Rachel at a well. And we're going to see three things. We're going to see three things. Number one, we're going to see what's behind our spiritual thirst. Uh, number two, we're going to look at the disillusionment that accompanies illegitimate thirst. And then we're going to see why we're all thirsting for more. You guys good with that? Yeah. Okay, so first, what's behind our spiritual thirst. Genesis 29, starting at verse 1. Then Jacob went on his journey and came to the land of the sons of the east. He looked and he saw a well in the field, and behold, three flocks of sheep were lying there beside it, from, uh, for from that well they watered the flocks. Now the stone in the mouth of the well was large. Now to verse 4. Jacob said to them, My brothers, where are you from? And they said, We're from Haran. He said to them, Do you know Laban, the son of Nahor? And they said, we know him. And he said to them, it is, is it well with him? And they said, it is well with him. And here is Rachel, his daughter, coming with the sheep. Skip to verse 11. Then Jacob kissed Rachel and lifted his voice and wept. Jacob told Rachel that he was a relative of her father and that he was Rebekah's son. And she ran and told her father on verse 14. Laban said to him, surely you are, bone, uh, you are my bone and my flesh. And he stayed with him for a month. Then Laban said to Jacob, because you're my relative, should you therefore serve me for nothing? Tell me, what should your wages be? Now, Laban had two daughters. The name of the older was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. And Leah's eyes were weak, but Rachel was beautiful of form and face. Now, Jacob loved Rachel, so he said, I will serve you seven years for your younger daughter, Rachel. Laban said, it's better that I give her to you than any other man, so stay with me. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed to him but a few days because of his love for her. Verse 21, the seven years are over. And Jacob said to Laban, give me my wife, for my time is completed. 
that I may go into her. Whew. <laughs> We're going to stop right there. <laughs> now, again, Jacob is uh, a man with an inner vacuum, an inner emptiness. He's a man of tremendous thirst. And we get a glimpse of where Jacob is in verse 15 when Laban asks him, what should his wages be? Now, how did Jacob get here? You got to know how he got here. So Jacob is the younger of twin boys. All right. He has an older brother named Esau who were born to his father, Isaac and Rebecca. And uh, although it was prophesied that the older would serve the younger, Esau would serve Jacob, uh, Isaac preferred and loved Esau. And because of that, Jacob grew up uh, feeling very rejected, feeling very unloved and therefore resentful. And so when Isaac began to get very old and very blind and near death, Jacob goes into his room and he dresses himself up as Esau and he tricks his blind father into giving him, Jacob, the deathbed blessing of the firstborn. So uh, his brother uh, Esau then from there uh, becomes very furious with him. He vows to kill him, and now Jacob has to run for his life. And so he takes off. And so Jacob has no money. He has no family. His only hope is to find his mother's relatives, and he finds his uncle Laban. And uh, in, in verse 16, 17, we begin to see uh, where Jacob is. We begin to see uh, just how he's coping with where he is in life. He says to his uncle Laban, I will work for you for seven years for your daughter, Rachel. Now, two things we learn from this. The first thing is that verse 17 says that Rachel is beautiful. It says she is beautiful in form and face. She is stunning. The Bible doesn't lie. If the Bible says you're a 10, you're a 10, okay? <laughs> That's the first thing we see. Number two, the second thing we see is that Jacob is absolutely in love with her. Because when he negotiates price, he says, I'll work for seven years. And what we know from archaeology, what we know from history, is that 30 to 40 shekels is what a suitor would typically pay a family for a bride. Right? That's like one, one and a half shekels per month. Uh, which is to say that he was offering to do for seven years what almost anyone else could do for less than two. I mean, he is not even negotiating. He's offering a large sum, which means he is absolutely out of his mind in love with this girl. He is what the great theologian Justin Timberlake would call love stoned. Is that, is that too modern? Yeah. Or, or, or is that too old? Like, I don't even know where I am anymore. Love stoned. He worked seven years, and it says that it seemed to him but a few days because of the love that he had for her. But it's really verse 21 that shows us just how punch drunk in love he is with Rachel. Listen to what he says to Laban, his uncle. Seven years is up. And then Jacob said to Laban, give me my wife. My time is completed. I want to lie with her. Now, I'm not um, an expert in premarital etiquette but I'm pretty strong in my stance. You probably shouldn't say that to your future father-in-law. <laughs> yeah? He steps to his father-in-law and he says, give me my wife, I wanna sleep with her. This brother's got a problem. <laughs> he has got a problem. Robert Alter, uh, who's a Jewish scholar in his Old Testament commentary, he writes that the narrator is telling us something very simple. Here is a man who is emotionally and sexually overwhelmed with longing for Rachel. So what's going on here? This is how Jacob is dealing with the failure of his life. Jacob looks at Rachel and he says, I never got my father's affection. I've lost my mother, the only woman who ever loved me. My brother hates my guts, he wants to kill me. I'm all alone, my, my life is completely falling apart, but Rachel, if I could just have her, if I could make the most beautiful woman in all the land, if I could make her my life, it would fix everything. Everything would go right. This would finally fix it. I would fill this hole. Uh, Ernest Becker was a, an American cultural anthropologist, and he wrote a book called The Denial of Death. 
And in his book, he, and this is a secular man, he was an atheist. He says that in ancient times, romantic love was seldom the basis for marriage. And even though it existed, by contrast, modern people load an enormous amount of spiritual freight into finding the right person. He goes on to say that you don't want to admit to what degree that modern people are making up for the lack of inner spiritual fullness by looking out there saying, I'm going to find that one. We still need to feel that our life matters in the scheme of things. We still want to merge ourselves with some higher self-absorbing meaning and trust and in gratitude. But if we no longer have God, how are we to do this? One of the first ways that occurred to the modern person was the romantic solution. The self-glorification that we need in our innermost being, we now look for in the love partner. So what is it that we want when we elevate the love partner to this position? We want to be rid of our faults. We want to be rid of our feeling of nothingness. We want to be justified. We want to know that our existence hasn't been in vain. We want redemption, nothing less. Now, this is not just Jacob. We do this too. So how, how am I going to get rid of this sense of insignificance and nothingness in my life? For Jacob, it was love. What is it for you? Is it addiction? Is it approval? You need validation from other people in your life. And so you're drinking from other people instead of God. Is it ambition? You gotta accomplish all these things just to make yourself feel like you're valuable. What is it? For Jacob, it was love. If I could just find the one true love, the one, then my life, We'll be okay. See, when we don't find peace, rest, hope, and significance in a relationship with Jesus, then we will find fraudulent alternatives, cracked cisterns to instead fill ourselves up. We will. We will uh, try to fill ourselves up. We will. And that's the key is we think that maybe we could just stay empty. That's not how it works for us. We will fill ourselves up with something. And if God is not our source, then it's on to disillusionment. So second, disillusionment. Verse 22. Laban gathered all the men of the place. Now, again, the seven years are over, and now he has to come through on giving his daughter away. He gathered all the men of the place and made a feast. Now, in the evening, he took his daughter Leah, and he brought her to him, and Jacob went into her. Laban also gave his maid Zilpah to his daughter Leah as a maid. So it came about in the morning that, behold, it was Leah. And so Jacob said to Laban, what is this that you've done to me? Was it not for Rachel that I serve with you? Why then have you deceived me? But Laban said, it's not the practice in our place to marry off the younger before the firstborn. Complete the work of this one, and we will give you the other for the service with which you will serve for me another seven years. Jacob did so. And completed her week, and he gave him his daughter, Rachel, as his wife. He also gave his maid, Bilhah, to Rachel as her maid. So Jacob went into Rachel also, and indeed, he loved Rachel more than Leah, and he served with Laban for yet another seven years. Another seven years. So Jacob offers seven years to Laban. The seven years are up, and now it's time for the wedding. Now, weddings in ancient times lasted all day. Uh, You you had the procession, you had the actual ceremony, and then you had the feast. Uh, And so naturally, at nighttime, it's dark outside, right? And, you know, Pastor Bob's boy, Thomas Eddy, hadn't yet created the incandescent light bulb, right? So he couldn't see Jacob. I'm trying to figure out how this happened to him. Maybe they ran out of candles, right? Maybe they drank a lot, but somehow... He goes in and his uncle Laban swaps out Rachel for Leah and Jacob goes and consummates marriage with the wrong woman. Don't get, I mean, come on. This is the best soap operas ever in the Bible. (laughs) The wrong woman. Jacob says, ah, Rachel, but in the morning it was Leah. Leah. Jacob runs to Laban and he says, what have you done? Has, wasn't it for Rachel? Wasn't it for Rachel that I worked all this time for you? 
I wondered, as I just continued to read the story over, I wondered how this got dealt with so easily. It just kind of died out, right? And this is, dece- this is pure evil, right? This is illegal. This is, you know, this is David Blaine, Tom Fullery. Like, how do you do this to someone? And it just dies out. And the reason why I think it dies out is because Laban's response to him translates into Hebrew. Literally, it says, around here, it is not the custom to put the younger before the older. I wonder if in that moment it clicked for Jacob. I wonder if in that moment he said, oh my goodness, he just did to me what I did to my father. My father reached out in the dark and thought I was Esau just as I reached out in the dark thinking it was Rachel. And so Jacob is crushed. He's been lied to. He's been exploited. When you're a con man, I mean, maybe you just can't see the forest from the sleeves. I don't know what it is. But he got conned by his own uncle. He is crushed. He's devastated. But he's not the only one that's devastated. Look at Leah. What are we told about Leah? Verse 17 says, Leah had weak eyes, but Rachel was beautiful in form and face. Jacob saw these two sisters, and with Rachel, he was immediately in love, immediately love-stoned, immediately. And so, you know, if Rachel had a song, surely Leah had a song, yeah? So let me tell you what it is. Leah was U G L Y. She didn't have no alibi. <laughs> Leah was ugly. Oh. Now, the Bible is really nice to her. It says weak eyes. But oh, I won't even say it again. <laughs> and what would be worse? What would be worse? than being ugly, can I tell you? Growing up with a sister who's drop dead gorgeous. And so Leah has a father who exploits her, a husband who doesn't love her, and a sister who's always been favored over her. She is the worst off in the story. But when Jacob wakes up in the morning, it was Leah. And we're being taught something here, that in in all of life, through every event, in every aspect of your life, there will be this thread of cosmic disappointment. And you will not lead a wise life until you understand this. See, Jacob goes to bed with the one. I finally got the one. I've worked seven years for the girl that I wanted. I finally got her. The one person who's finally going to make my life okay. But what we see literally in the Hebrews, it says, but behold, in the morning, it was Leah. Now, I love Leah. Um, I wish I had time to really go deeper into her story. She has such a beautiful redemption story that you should see how God, the scripture literally says, and God loved her. God loved her. Not only did he love her, he did something so beautiful in her. She becomes one of the mothers of Jesus. That She gives birth to Judah, who's in Jesus' ancestry. I mean, her story ends so beautifully. But, but, but we learn something about this situation with Leah. She represents something to Jacob and to us. Every single time you get started in a new relationship, every time you move into a marriage, you launch into a new job or to a new opportunity, and you think this is finally going to make my life right, and you think uh, it's finally going to come through for me, I want you to know in the morning it is always Leah. You go to bed with Rachel, but it is always, (laughs) always Leah. I was at uh, men's breakfast with uh, the guys yesterday, and I sat around the table with B.B. King. uh, That's Bud Browning, for those of you who don't know. (laughs) That's going to catch on. I want everyone to say that. So B.B. King and Bill and my new friend Bob, and we were all just talking about life and uh, kind of the the phases, the seasons of life that we're, that, that we're in. Uh, Bud is already uh, retired. The other two are retiring really soon. It just got me thinking about just my seasons of life. And I, I just started thinking about to my 20s. I'm in my mid-30s now. I'm still trying to hang on to mid-30s. 
I, I'm hanging on. Mid-30s. But when I was in my 20s, I remember thinking to myself, man, if I can just get to this income level, if I can just hit this number income-wise, my life's going to be set. It's going to be amazing. But what none of you guys told me <laughs> was that as my girls get older, they get more expensive. <laughs> and so it's just been a wash. Matter of fact, like, it's not even a wash. I got to that level, and I'm still hurting. Why? Because I went to bed with Rachel, but I woke up, and it was Leah. Um, I have uh, friends, because here's the thing. For me, now the next level, and Brandon and I, we talk about this. Like, man, when we get into our mid-40s, we're going to take over the world. Man, our girls are going to be older. Like, man, we're going to have it together. And so, in a way, I've been kind of looking towards being, you know, an empty nester, but I have friends who are empty nesters, and they've said to me, man, I couldn't wait till my kids left. And they're like, but now I'm miserable. Because for them, they went to bed with Rachel. <laughs> but when they woke up in the morning, it was Leah. My friends yesterday, they were talking about having senioritis, about being ready to retire. They're so close to retirement. But I have a really... Dear, dear friends, actually my father-in-law, who we, Amy and I, we watched him in this process of getting ready to retire, and he retired. And I can just tell you, he works harder now than he did before he retired. And so I'm just thinking, man, even in retirement, if I'm looking forward to stopping my career, man, I'm going to try to go to bed with Rachel, but I'm going to wake up, and it's going to be Leah. It's going to be Leah. We will be tempted to quench our thirst with other things, but they will never satisfy. C.S. Lewis said it this way in Mere Christianity. He said, there's always something we have grasped at in the first moment of longing that just fades away in the reality. The spouse may be a good spouse. The scenery has been excellent. It's turned out to be a good job, but it, the thing that we thought was going to be in the center of it, always evades us. In the morning, it's always Leah. There is no other stream. You better check yourself before you wreck yourself. <laughs> so we talked about how a thirsty approach to living apart from God in an effort to fill the empty lungs of our hearts always produces disillusionment. Lastly, I just want to show you why we're all thirsting for more. And Morgan and the team, you guys can come back. We're going to finish up here. Centuries later, after the Genesis 29 boy meets girl story between Jacob and Rachel at a well, there was another one. And in John chapter 4, Jesus meets a Samaritan woman, and he begins to have a conversation with her about thirst. Jesus uh, and his disciples are on their way back from Judea, and they're headed to Galilee, and in order to get to Galilee, you have to go through Samaria. But, but Jews hated Samaritans so much that they would actually go around. They would take a longer route and go around Samaria to get to Galilee. But the Bible says in John chapter 4, verse 4, that Jesus had to go through Samaria. He had to go through. And verse 6 says that Jacob's well was there. It's the well that Jacob gave to, 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 uh, to his son. Um, Joseph, and I, I, I tried to do the research to see if it was the same well. I, I couldn't, that would have been cool, but I couldn't find if it was. But he sees Jacob's well there, and suddenly, oh so suddenly, and I think about this, they just took this journey from Judea, and they go into Samaria, and all of a sudden, Jesus just begins to grow faint and tired from the journey. He says to his disciples, why don't you guys go ahead to, to Galilee? Why don't you guys go, go ahead and go get food. I'm going to stay here by this well. But what Jesus was really doing is he knew that a woman was coming. And so this woman comes to the well. Now, women didn't go to wells by themselves, and especially in the heat of the day, at noon, it says it was. And so she was going there. She was by herself, and it was hot outside. Women usually go earlier in the day as groups, but as we're going to see, she's a social outcast. She was trying to get to the well when no one would be there. She didn't expect to see anyone at the well. 
But she walks up to the well, she locks eyes with Jesus. And in my mind, I can just see how she locks eyes and Jesus is just sitting there. Oh, what's up? I love how Jesus does this. I love how he introduces himself to us in our mess. Jesus said to the woman at the well, whoever drinks this water, chapter four, verse 13, whoever drinks this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks the water I will give them shall never thirst, but the water I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. Jesus is the only person who can meet our most important needs. No one can meet the deepest needs in our lives. Our needs for acceptance and approval and affection, attention. Only God can satisfy those needs in our lives. And if we don't trust Jesus to do this, then we will transfer them to people and things around us. And so if you don't have an active, ongoing relationship with Jesus you will automatically transfer. You, you will put demands on people and things that cannot be met. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so I will not be thirsty nor come all the way to draw. He said to her, go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you have correctly said I have no husband for you have had five husbands and the one whom you have now is not your husband. You have said this truly. See, this woman at the well married a man and uh, she wanted him to do what only God could do. And when he couldn't, she got discouraged. We do this too, don't we? We get in relationships and we have all these expectations of how wonderful things are going to be. And we begin to try to drink all these God needs. But Jesus isn't the source. Our love partner is. This woman married a man. This was her approach. She married a man and she squeezed him. And because enough of God didn't come out, she got discouraged. She thought she made a mistake. She did this five times. This man couldn't fulfill her. The relationship broke down. And so she got into another one. This man couldn't fulfill her. The relationship broke down. And so she got another one. And again and again and again, she did this. And finally, she said, I'm not getting married anymore. I'll live with a man, but I am not getting married. And Jesus walks up to her at this well and he says, woman, you're a wreck. You're drinking from the wrong source. If you keep drinking from the well of men, you will keep being thirsty. I'm the one you're looking for. There is no other stream. He said to her, but if you understood the gift of God and the one you're talking to, you would ask me for a drink and I would give you living water and you would never thirst again. See, in this one encounter, this one conversation, Jesus healed this woman and filled her to the point where she could go back into a city that, that did not like her, a, a city that rejected her, and tell every, become an evangelist and tell everyone about Jesus. One conversation. One drink from Jesus. And so how could Jesus do this? Huh? How... Could Jesus heal this woman? How could Jesus make good on this offer of living water that could quench her eternal thirst? I'll tell you how. Because a couple years later, there would be another meeting. And this time, it wouldn't be at a well. It'd be a cross. And on the cross, one of the last things Jesus said was what? I thirst. On the cross, Jesus became thirsty so that you and I could be filled. Listen, on the cross, Jesus became desperate and parched so that the deepest longings of our souls could be quenched. And I know I turned this message into a, a chick flick, boy meets girl movie. So maybe you're looking for a moral to this story. So let me tell you what it is. The moral of this story is that your morals will not get you into God's story. No, 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 no. God had to come down into your story. And I know you may be feeling empty. I know you may be looking for something to fill you up. But Jesus poured himself out on the cross 
to give you everything you need. That boy, that girl, that relationship, that job, that opportunity. I know, I know, I know, I know. It looks like Rachel. But behold, one day you'll see it's Leah. And so if your life is feeling adrift today, if, you, if you're guilty like I have been many times of spiritual drifting, I want you to know that Jesus is an anchor. He is reliable. If you've been pushed around by the waves and the winds of life, Jesus can be trusted. Jesus uh, became ugly. Jesus became weak. Jesus was used. He was exploited so that when you and I believe in him, when you and I believe in him, oh God, when you and I believe in him, we're covered. But we got to check ourselves before we wreck ourselves. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. Father, hmm, I thank you that you've put a thirst in us that can only be filled by you. But Lord, our hearts will remain restless until they rest in you. And there's so many things in our lives that give, get us overloaded, that get us busy, that put us in a hurry. But Lord, may we slow down enough. May we create spiritual disciplines in our lives to help us to guard against spiritual drift. Help us, Lord, to check ourselves before we wreck ourselves. Thank you, God, for living water that never runs dry. Thank you, Jesus, for pouring yourself out for us. And it's in your name we pray. And everyone said, amen. 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 God bless you guys.